Hi, good afternoon and good morning to everybody on this FINOS virtual meetup. I'm James McLeod, the Director of Community at FINOS, and you're joining me today with Chris West, Director of Solutions Engineering, and Ian Mesner, Chief Architect at Chart IQ, who are FINOS members. And today, both Chris and Ian have joined us um, to present how to secure the electron container for capital markets. But before we get started with the presentation this afternoon, I'd like to let everybody know that we'll be giving away a free FINOS t-shirt to a couple of people, maybe two or three, picked at random, um, if you have actually uh, registered and subscribed um, for this event. If you haven't registered for this event, uh, please head over to the FINOS um, blog uh, where you can register and then be uh, in with the chance of actually um, winning a FINOS t-shirt that we will ship to you. And also remember to subscribe to the FINOS page on LinkedIn and also uh, look for FINOS Foundation on Twitter uh, where you can follow us and head over to finos.org where you can register for all of our newsletters and also find a very helpful Get Involved page where you can learn how to become a FINOS contributor and get involved in all of our projects. If you are a developer and you would like to actually start raising pull requests and contributing to FINOS, um, head over to github.com forward slash FINOS where you'll find our GitHub organization. Um, you'll be able to engage with all of our GitHub issues and start um, having conversations with our teams. And if you've got any questions um, with regards to the webinar this afternoon, feel free to use the chat window in WebEx um, where you'll see the social commentary running and we'll relay all of your questions over to the presenters or we'll ask them for you during the Q&A session. And this is also the area where uh, Grizz will be putting all of the links. So with that, I'd like to pass the mic over to Chris West. Hi, Chris, over to you. Thanks, James. So the purpose of today's talk is to familiarize you with security concepts as they relate to the Electron framework and how we at Chart IQ work with Electron in a secure fashion. So today we're going to discuss Electron's makeup at a high level and how it's most commonly used and then how that differs from typical use cases in capital markets and the problem that that presents us with. We're going to cover web application security and the, browser, the comfort of the browser sandbox and how that differs from security for the smart desktop or desktop interop as some people call it. Then we'll move on to implementing the Electron project security checklist for untrusted content and our approach to that via policy-based security. Finally, we're going to introduce you to the secure electron adapter that we've recently contributed to FINOS and how that's based on security policies, secure communication methods, and an approach to application management that we use in our flagship smart desktop product, Finsomble. So if you're attending this webinar, you probably already know something about the open source electron framework, which, as the Electron Quick Start Guide puts it, enables you to create desktop applications with pure JavaScript by providing a runtime with rich native APIs. And Electron uses web pages as its GUI, allowing developers to leverage the many and varied advances in web technology, HTML5, and the truly awesome number of JavaScript frameworks and libraries out there in creating user interfaces for their apps. Now, there are loads of applications out there already based on Electron several of which you're probably already using, including Skype, Microsoft Teams, Symfony, Slack, Evernote, and for the developers amongst you, VS Code and GitHub Desktop, to name but a few. It's also the foundation on which we build one of our products, Finsomble, the smart desktop framework for finance. Electron is based on and incorporates two other very important open source projects that you will have heard of, Node.js, which is a JavaScript runtime focused on web servers that extends JavaScript to use cases outside of the browser, and Chromium, an open source browser project that forms the basis for Google Chrome and is also a fully featured web browser in its own right. Again, quoting from the Electron Quick Start Guide, you could see Electron as a variant of the Node.js runtime that is focused on desktop applications instead of web servers, and 
as Electron uses web pages as its GUI, you could also see it as a minimal Chromium browser controlled by JavaScript. Ultimately, Electron combines web server technology with web browser technology to allow us to use web technologies to build desktop applications. Now, there's essentially a dichotomy in how these two technologies and projects access content, which bleeds over into Electron and affects how you might use it and how you might think about and provide security for that use. If you're an application vendor, you're probably looking to use Electron as the runtime for your app with a polished GUI built with web technologies, but essentially packaged and shipped with it to be installed on a user's computer, plus some powerful desktop and file system APIs from Node and Electron itself that allow you to easily create a great desktop app experience. Whereas if you're looking to build what so many of us are in capital markets, an ecosystem of separate applications from multiple sources that are all talking to each other and interoperating, what we at Chart IQ think of as a smart desktop, then you're probably also looking to gain the myriad benefits of web deployment and interop, such as the ability to update code without having to run installers or have lengthy conversations with your IT department to deploy it. You also might be looking for ways to combine apps or components from different teams or vendors and enjoy loose coupling between the components rather than having to build monolithic projects as many of us have had to in the past. So do we need to secure Electron? Well, for single application vendors, the answer is no, not really. Now, if you think back to when you last installed one of these products that are already based on Electron, did you worry about security? Probably not. If you're a single application vendor, then the same most likely applies to your users. They don't have to worry about the app attacking the desktop, and they've already decided to trust you when they installed your app, just like you decided to trust Microsoft when you installed Skype. Now, granted, you may have had to provide some answers or insurances to their InfoSec or IT teams, but ultimately they've decided to trust you. There's also only one vendor involved here, so little need to worry about multiple apps attacking or spying on each other or just generally interfering with each other. In our smart desktops, on the other hand, there's a very different level of complexity and security concerns to deal with that have more in common with consuming software from the web. Now, you might be thinking, hang on, I don't worry about this when accessing a web app in my browser. And that's because developers have been building business apps on the web for many, many years now. We're all used to worrying about things like cross-site scripting and SQL injections, and we follow standards and best practices. Plus, both common vulnerabilities and best practices for web app development are analyzed and published by organizations like the Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP, who publish their list of the top 10 web app security risks. There's also the Software Engineering Institute, Carnegie Mellon, which runs the CERT program and the US Department of Homeland Security Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, along with a number of other national level organizations from other parts of the world, all of whom maintain their own lists of active exploits and security vulnerabilities. For example, this list comes from the OWASP project. It's known as the OWASP Top 10 Web Application Security Risks. Now, most of these lists have similar themes. Cleanse your inputs, establish user credentials with encryption or off-source that to SAML or LDAP or some SSO system. Control access to resources through role-based authorization and access control lists. Audit dependencies and audit all your code. And then log access and lock down log information. These themes are well known in the industry. They are best practices and they are religiously adhered to with numerous firms available to independently evaluate your product security through penetration testing. But we're all also used to working in a very safe environment that is the browser tab. Built by a large team of engineers, browsers are able to quickly respond to newly discovered security threats. And they were designed from the beginning to execute remote, untrusted code. And we've relied on that underlying security for decades. Browsers include a very restricted offering of operating system APIs, so you don't get access to the file system, the registry, user settings, et cetera. And there's a permission API to ask the user before granting access to facilities like the microphone, camera, geolocation data, et cetera. 
They also have an integrated sandbox so that all comms between browser instances is broken through the main process with token validation used to ensure that it's coming from the assumed browser instance. And they've implemented site isolation. So every web browser instance is launched in a new process, which you can see in your task manager, which also ensures that memory and settings running within one web browser instance can't be accessed or modified by another. And finally, they've implemented web security policies that restrict communication based on the origin of the data or the page that's being displayed, the dreaded cause policies. But didn't I say Electron was based on a web browser? Well, it is based on Chromium, which does take significant steps to ensure that the remote code loaded within a web page can't affect the system or the contents of other browser windows. But it's also based on Node.js, which we've already established is a web server and server-side general purpose programming language, and isn't actually designed out of the box for running remote code. Plus, the Electron project have added loads more powerful tools to help you build your desktop app experience and have your various apps and windows talk to each other. Hence, Electron isn't necessarily designed with security in mind because you don't always need it, and it can actually get in the way when you're building a, an application, which we're going to look at more in a minute. But it does contain all the technology necessary to secure it. It just doesn't ship with it all set up for our use case. So to recap on our smart desktop use case, we're integrating apps from multiple sources. We're using web technology to build applications outside of the browser. But we also want to enable communications and interop between those applications safely. So how do we protect the operating system and the various apps from each other while still enabling interoperability and safely gaining the benefits of access to desktop APIs? A smart desktop or desktop interrupt product offers a unique set of challenges because similar to the web browsers, they launch remote applications. And these must be assumed to be corrupted by or otherwise re represent a bad actor trying to get access to both the system itself and the content of apps or users. And unlike web browsers, the smart desktop needs to offer a much richer set of functionality similar to desktop applications interacting directly with the operating system and each other. This leads to two classes of issue. The first is security between applications that are now allowed to communicate with each other in a way that was never contemplated by the browser. Um, for example, an online banking tab and a Facebook tab don't often talk to each other and can't talk to each other. So developers don't need to worry about that instance. But in an unsecured desktop web container, they possibly can. Now, we call this content security, i.e. making sure that hostile apps can't scrape information from each other, impersonate each other, or sniff messages sent between other applications. The second issue is applications interfacing with the desktop without the security of the browser sandbox. And we call that system security or protecting the operating system from hostile applications. Content security and system security are pretty broad, broad topics. Um, and at ChartQ, we've developed a framework that's inspired by the OWASP top 10 to break down the core elements and guide our own work on Finsomble, which we refer to internally as the big eight. For the system security, we need to ensure that best practices are followed um, for scrubbing inputs, verifying credentials, locking down access, and running audits. And for content security, we need to offer functionality that makes it trivial to have secure communication and storage and lockdown runtime state and configuration. And we must provide a smart desktop experience without having multiple gaping security holes. So both classes, the problem need to be addressed. And it's really the job of the smart desktop application, the container for the other apps to solve these problems, or at least ensure they are solvable rather than pushing that down to the applications that it's actually hosting. Fortunately, the team at Electron are well aware of the problem and they go to pains to ensure that the users of the Electron framework understand that it's not a web browser and state in the Electron security tutorial that it allows you to build feature rich desktop applications with familiar web technologies, but your code wields much greater power. 
They also make clear that most popular Electron apps display primarily local content or trusted secure remote content without node integration. Now, if you must run arbitrary content from untrusted sources, as we definitely need to in a smart desktop app, they provide a checklist of 17 recommendations to ensure that you remain secure. Now, these include things like only loading secure content, disabling node.js integration in all the renderers, enabling context isolation in all the renderers. I'm not going to read the whole list because it's long, but um, goes right the way down to disabling Electron's remote module or filtering it if you can't turn it off and using a current version of Electron. Now, these recommendations don't directly address every point on our big eight, but if we don't adopt them, any solutions we do attempt will be corrupted by gaping security holes. So the obvious next step is to implement the checklist and by adhering to all of Electron's security recommendations, we'll gain content security because our apps are isolated from each other by that context isolation they're going to struggle to interoperate with each other. We'll also gain system security because the Electron main process and by extension, the operating system will be insulated from our apps. But at the cost of those apps being cut off from the very desktop APIs, we needed Electron to give us access to in the first place. All in all, that's not an ideal situation. So what do we do now? If we lock down our entire framework, we might as well go back to the browser. The answer is to separate out our secure, trusted code from the arbitrary content from untrusted sources and handle them differently. That's going to allow us to build a set of microservices for the desktop, what we refer to in FinSombo as desktop services, that will help us implement that rich desktop functionality. And these should be able to talk to the Electron main process to do what they need to do, but should also be isolated from the untrusted content to keep them secure. And then we'll implement a system for inter-process communication to permit controlled access to these services. Now to do this all efficiently, we need to be able to simply declare what privileges each piece of code and each associated render process has access to. And we call that policy-based security. Each API that is accessed within the Electron layer can be enabled or disabled through config on a per app basis or by assigning apps to groups that have their own set of permissions, so security policies. This practice basically enables the principle of least privilege. That's a well-respected security practice of ensuring that a given module or individual has access to what is needed and nothing more. And web deployment via a declarative or config driven approach to defining your apps, which is something we at Chart IQ believe is key to being able to achieve the full benefits of web deployment for apps. The combination of desktop services and that config driven approach, and by extension, the policy based security, are pretty much the cornerstones on which Fensemble is built. And so, on to the announcement. At ChartIQ, we're firm believers in both open source software, which our products, like almost anything involving the web, are based on, and collaboration, which is why we offer full source access to all our clients using Finsomble. Ultimately, we also believe that the best way to stay secure is to be open and transparent about how we approach security on the desktop and to collaborate with a community that shares the same goals and benefits from the same work. Hence today, we're thrilled to announce the Secure Electron Adapter, or SEA for short, which uses the same code and approach that we do in the Finsomble Electron Adapter that ships with Finsomble, and that we've contributed that to Finos, the FinTech Open Source Foundation, and of course, our hosts today. SEA adheres to Electron's own security recommendations by design, including enabling context isolation, removing direct access to node, um, disabling and or filtering the remote module, etc., and provides a ready-to-use system for policy-based security in Electron with inter-process comms that uh, work with that security to ensure that your renderer processes can do what they need to do and no more. You can get your hands on SEA, as you'd expect from Finnis's GitHub at the addresses shown, where you'll find two repositories for SEA, one containing the main SEA module and a second containing the SEA Quick Start project. That, now, that's a minimal Electron app using SEA. We'll have a look at it in a minute. And it's 
It's based on the Electron Quick Start Guide for inspiration, and it demonstrates the basics of using SEA, including a sample manifest file, uh, some comp configured components, and preloads for customizing your windows. Now, the most important thing to note about SEA is that it is config driven by a manifest file, an example of which you'll find in the SEA Quick Start project, which was shown here. The manifest is used to configure the main window, which is loaded from a remote application, uh, remote location even. And as we learned earlier, it should probably be loaded via a secure transport and from a trusted location only. Now that can be a visible window or a non-visible one to be used more like a service to manage your application. That's actually the approach we use in Finsomble. And it can have additional content preloaded into it, which is JavaScript functions that you're essentially adding to the window. Next, you can configure other windows or components of your desktop app. These are also loaded from remote locations and again, can be visible windows or hidden ones. That will allow you to build application components or your own desktop services. And they can have permissions specified on them, giving them you fine grained control over what each of those components is able to do. For example, this untrusted component has been denied access to system APIs for clearing the cache or exiting the runtime, as well as having its access to certain JavaScript functions and Chromium web preferences curtailed. Finally, you can set overall preferences for the Electron adapter, such as a list of trusted preloads, which can then be applied to the components in the main window. So on to a demo. Now, we're going to try and do this live, so fingers crossed. Um, here's my VS code where I've got the SEA quick start project loaded up. Um, I'm showing the index.html file. We're going to use this for a number of different components. We're going to use the same uh, file for brevity and sort of to prove the uh, security policies use case. Our manifest that you've already seen is here along with um, those components. As you can see, we're using index.html, add in a preload. And in the case of the untrusted child, having some permissions set on them. Our preload just contains some functions we want to add into the window. Um, it's a great way to add APIs for your services. And finally, uh, this renderer.js file, which is loaded into index.js to do something interesting with SEA. For example, we can get a reference to the current window um, or version information or monitor information for the system. Um, and we could also use that current window to do things like um, moving a window around. So we could get the bounds for, uh, for that window. We could set the bounds to actually move it. Well, we could also use the SEA main process to get hold of the manifest, to give us details of other components and actually launch other windows. So let's try this out. I've already installed my dependencies at NPM, so we'll start her up. And here we go. This is our main window. It's visible in this case. And you can see we can do things with it. It's rendering some details about its current bounds, the monitor information, etc. And I can launch a trusted application, which is here. Uh, same index file, it's just um, picking up its own name. And again, it can do all the usual things, including exiting the runtime. So let's just start that up one more time. So here he is again. This time I'm going to launch the untrusted child application, which is here. And this one, as I mentioned, has been denied the permission to exit the runtime. So if I hit exit, nothing happens. And if I go ahead and launch a JavaScript console, you can actually see we're getting an error message back from SEA whenever we hit that button. Um, access is denied to system.exit. So there's our security policy in action. Uh, Okay, so moving back to our presentation, what does SEA not do? Well, it doesn't include detailed desktop services or ready-made UI components, or in fact, full solutions to the whole of the big eight. Rather, it's focused on a secure foundation on which to build these. Also, obviously being a non-commercial product, it doesn't have any support services included. So if you need more than that for your project, then of course, we'd encourage you to come and talk to us about Finsomble. 
which is a fully featured smart desktop for finance and makes use of the same techniques and code as the secure electron adapter. But it does take things a lot further with a full set of desktop services for facilities such as secure storage, um, messaging for interop, workspace management, easy integration for auth systems, search federation, hotkeys, and a whole lot more. And as mentioned during our discussion, Finsomble APIs act through services that run in separate processes, creating an air gap between your applications and Finsomble system code. It also ships with a fully fledged user interface that you can white label and customize, and it can even extend its desktop services and window management user experience to native apps that can be seamlessly integrated into the same smart desktop alongside your HTML. We're proud to base Finsomble on Electron, Chromium, and Node.js, and now also the techniques and code that form the secure Electron adapter. We're also the only container vendor to provide 100% full source code access to our clients and are, of course, happy to share our most recent third party security assessment by Bishop Fox. So to summarize what we've learned today, Electron isn't designed to be secure out of the box, as that would complicate things for desktop app developers. Um, but building a smart desktop leveraging web deployment basically creates new risks for us to manage. But the Electron project does care deeply about the security of the applications you build that way, as does any responsible software developer or vendor. And they actually provide a detailed 17 point security checklist for securing untrusted content running in your app. However, implementing that checklist can eliminate many of the benefits of using the container in the first place. Um, so we at ChartEQ have come up with and believe in a policy-based security approach and desktop services um, that provide a sort of practical answer to developing within that container. And then finally, the secure electron adapter provides an ideal foundation to build all of that on top of. So that concludes the main presentation today, and I'll hand back over to James, who I think is going to pose us any questions that have been asked during the session. And joining me, of course, is Ian Mesner, the Chief Architect at Chart IQ, who will actually help answer some of those questions. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, for being here this afternoon. And we do actually have uh, our first question from Isabel which is, is Electron intended for use by application providers, square bracket, to build web application with desktop versions, close square bracket, or by application users, lots of square brackets here, for use as an adapter for web-based applications by an organization? Yeah, I think this is uh, Ian, uh, I can take that. Um, uh, I would say both use cases are pretty common. Um, uh, many uh, organizations that uh, were maybe web technology first uh, are offering a desktop uh, version of their application through Electron that simply loads content uh, from uh, their web servers. And that allows uh, to add some rich functionality uh, such as uh, local caching or proxying or window management, child windows. Um, so in, in that sense, it's really just a, a uh, more fully featured version of the existing web technology. And also uh, it is used as a bit of an integration platform uh, for uh, adding functionality to existing websites or uh, uh, combining functionalities across websites. Um, and uh, Finsemble Smart Desktop uh, uh, we tell our clients that this can be used to uh, slowly um, integrate their existing applications together into common workflows and automate some of the connections between them. So I think both are, um, are, uh, are active use cases for the Electron framework. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I just uh, wanted to be sure I understood that correctly and uh, appreciate your answer. Um, another maybe small follow-up question. Um, I, I know that uh, Finos has been kind of an active proponent of uh, the FDC3. Um, can you maybe develop a little bit on how um, a framework like that uh, fits in with uh, Electron and uh, I, I guess how uh, one would uh, they're completely different things and I'm aware of that I guess um, I, I'm trying to piece in my head how to fit it together. Sure. Um, so 
Uh, Electron allows uh, a developer to uh, preload functionality um, uh, that can be called by an, uh, a web application uh, to gain access to um, kind of rich desktop functionality. Um, and so that can be just arbitrary code. Um, uh, for the uh, SEA project, we um, included kind of very common basic operations of moving windows, um, uh, some messaging, so on and so forth. Uh, FDC3 um, tries to establish uh, an open standard for common communication mechanisms, such as the description of an application or uh, the launching of an, uh, of an action uh, through intents. Um, so that is trying to uh, put a standard, an open standard around otherwise uh, kind of common, uh, very specific um, one-off pieces of functionality. So uh, Fensemble, for instance, uh, contains um, uh, FDC3 functionality for managing uh, applications from an AppD server, uh, allowing an application to register for an intent. Um, and uh, that application might fit into another integration platform that supports FDC3 automatically simply because they're adhering to an open standard. Right, that's amazing. And thank you, Isabel, for, the, for that question. Um, and thank you for answering, um, Ian. So whilst we've been having the Q&A, um, Chris has been working uh, busy in the background um, with a random person generator to pull two names out the hat for a free Finos t-shirt. And I'm pleased to announce that actually Isabel Gonzalez, um, you did win a Finos t-shirt and I can guarantee it was at random. So not only did you ask questions, but you won a t-shirt as well. Um, and also uh, Reza Alavi from Wipro, you've also won a Finos t-shirt too. Um, so thank, thank you. you very much. My pleasure. Um, Thank you everybody for being here this afternoon. It's now two minutes past the hour. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Chris and Ian um, from Chart IQ for that amazing. Reza, I think that you're off mute now. <laughs> but whilst um, Reza is talking in the background, um, I'd like to say thank you to Chris and Ian um, for your wonderful presentation and demo. Um, thank you to the Chart IQ team for, you know, coming forward and presenting to Finos and thank you for everybody who's joined us today. Um, it's been wonderful having you and please follow us on LinkedIn where you'll find out more of our web webinars that are happening in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you.